Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello, welcome to Whores Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. Uh, Today, we are psyched to be interviewing Adriana Gober, who is the director of programming, a.k.a. movie mistress, for the horror streaming service Midnight Movie Society, which showcases extreme underground, taboo, creature features, and cult horror movies. And we cannot wait to hear more about it. She's also a contributing author for the website cinepunks.com, a self-described, quote, community of writers, thinkers, artists, and weirdos all lending their talents to create a unique voice in the cultural conversation, unquote. Adriana programs films at a local art house cinema, is a podcaster, go women podcasters, a musician, an avid reader with a passion for social issues, and my God, does she do anything else? Um, and of course, she's a huge horror fan. Adriana, thank you so much for taking time out of your clearly very busy schedule to talk with us today. Thank you for having me. We're, we're thrilled to have you here. First things first, let's talk about Midnight Movie Society. Um, I did a little homework to prep for our chat, and understand that I'm going to go with MMS as the short version for Midnight Movie Society, if that's okay. (laughs) No, that's perfectly fine. (laughs) Awesome. Uh, I understand that MMS is a collaboration between MVD Entertainment Group and the horror magazine uh, Rue Morgue. Can you tell us a little bit about the inception of Midnight Movie Society and how you came to be involved? Sure. So initially... Um, you know, what got MVD thinking about starting their own streaming service for horror was that um, a lot of uh, their labels had films and, and other content up on uh, the larger streaming platforms like Amazon and Google Play. And um, over and over again, they were seeing that content removed um, due to, uh, you know, very strict content restrictions that these platforms had. So, uh, they started to think, you know, these these films deserve to be seen, so how can we create a space for them and not have to worry about uh, retaliation for content? And so uh, they decided to launch their own streaming service, uh, and they reached out to Rue Morgue um, just because, you know, that's a, a pretty well-known and well-respected horror publication, and, uh, you know, they, they just wanted uh, to team team up And uh, then, you know, uh, the way I came into it was I had been programming films for a couple of years, and uh, I just knew some of the folks at MVD uh, from seeing them at at various events, and uh, they knew I was a horror fanatic and that I was knowledgeable about the genre, and I followed it closely. So uh, they invited me to serve as the curator and acquisitions a uh, person for Midnight Movie Society, and so far it's been a lot of fun and uh, a really great opportunity. That's awesome. You kind of actually answered <laughs> one of my follow-up questions, but I'm curious, how do you get around any sort of streaming restrictions or anything like that for the movies that you guys want to show? Midnight Movie Society is powered by Vimeo OTT, mm-hmm. and they, they do have certain restrictions. So for the most part, it's kind of just up to our discretion, you know, what we want to put on our platform. So there's not as much oversight as there would be on, say, Amazon. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm assuming the people signing up for the service know what they're kind of getting into. So. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, we understand that, uh, you know, Midnight Movie Society is more of a niche streaming service. Um, and we're really catering to uh, specific kinds of, of horror and genre fans. Uh, and so, you know, we make it very clear that the website, although there there's more mainstream things on Midnight Movie Society as well, but it, it definitely caters to fans of more extreme horror films, um, in particular, gore and splatter films. Actually, speaking along those lines, uh, can you tell us what your curation process is like for Midnight Movie Society? Until very recently, uh, I was a little bit limited in, in the kinds of films that I could um, add to the website just because we were sticking to films that were already part of the MVD film library. Um, so the acquisitions part 
is a is, is an aspect of the role that I have only just started to really dip my feet into uh, because I now now that the 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 site has existed for almost a year now it's time to start looking for some fresh content and start looking outside of what was already uh, within the fi MVD film library until recently I kind of I I was picking from a limited pool of films uh, and now I'm kind of starting to branch out more and I'm, I'm looking for I follow a lot of uh, horror blogs and news sites and I'm in a lot of groups so I, I try to look out for a lot of indie films or, or smaller features that um, show innovation and creativity or just something I find cool that I think you know could benefit from being on our site and I'm also trying to get some more uh, female directed and, and LGBT focused films on the site as well. We do have some, but again, I was kind of limited in what I could choose from. So now I'm, I'm really trying to uh, broaden our horizons a bit. And do you make it a point to watch all the movies that you add to the collection or are there some that you just, you read about and you're like, okay, I think we should add this one without actually having to watch it. Or what is your um, process with that? I try to watch as much as I can because I kind of want to know what I'm putting up there. Um, <laughs> and, a, and a lot of the stuff I was already familiar with when I accepted the role, just from, you know, being extremely interested in, in the horror genre since I was a kid. It's just something that I've always followed. So I've seen a lot of movies. But yeah, uh, generally, if, if I don't watch the, an entire film, I'll at least try to, you know, s scan through it to get an idea of, um, the kind of movie it is, um, not only to, to know what content I'm promoting, but also just, just so I can market it, you know, and, and you have to be able to talk about these films. So I, I want to know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Is there, um, are there any type of movies that you would refuse to put on MMS? Like anything that you think would push boundaries too much or crosses any sort of lines? Um, I'm trying to think here. I don't know. That's that's kind of tricky because a lot of these movies trade in, you know, extreme violence and in some cases sexual violence. I think maybe I, w I would draw the line at something that, you know, it, it, we, we're not live leak. So obviously snuff films or things of that nature would not have a place on our website. Um, mm -hmm. But but generally speaking, we're, we're pretty uh, we're pretty open. Um, shifting gears just slightly, um, I noticed online you were featured in a video from, is it Art Quest Bethlehem? Oh, God. <laughs> well, <laughs> where you listed your top 10 favorite movies of the two, the 2010s. And personally, I was thrilled to see that The Handmaiden was your number two pick. Oh, I, I adore that movie. I, I like, I love Shan Wen, I can never say his name. Park Shan Wook. Thank you. <laughs> What she said. <laughs> um, I love him anyway, but I actually watched The Handmaiden with a group of friends like a year ago first because we were excited to see it. And I, we were all just blown away yet again by him. It's, it's so beautiful. And I love that movie. And revisiting a film whose plot revolves around a le lesbian love story yet is directed by a well-known horror film director. You know, I, I'm curious to know what your experience has been as a queer woman in horror spaces, both as a fan, a writer, and now as a curator for MMS? That's an interesting question. And it's kind of complicated because I feel like there's a few facets to it. Um, although I guess I'll just start by saying that uh, for the most part, I think he did a really great job with that film. I don't think it is overly male gazy, although there is one scene in particular that takes me right out of the movie every time. Uh, I th and I think it's like the most notorious scene in the film. I don't know if I need to go into details about it. I mean, if you really want to, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but... I mean, this scissoring scene. But it's such a good movie otherwise. I agree you did a really good job. And uh, I don't know if you've read the book that it's based on, The Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. I've not, no. Uh, it, it's fantastic. That and Tipping the Velvet, I really uh, recommend reading both of those novels. Um so I feel like it's weird because horror is a genre that queer people have historically gravitated to because it so often centers 
outsiders and 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 misfits people who are misunderstood uh, sometimes quite literally they're monsters so i've I've encountered like a lot of other queer people in horror communities, but at the same time, uh, there is this weird kind of um, like boys club mentality to a lot of horror circles. By that I mean, you know, straight white males are still kind of like the predominant voice in these spaces. And often that creates an environment that can be um, a bit hostile or unwelcoming, um, especially when you try to address um, you know, like microaggressions or, or, or other things that are going on within the community that are, are toxic. Yeah, it, it's kind of complicated because um, generally speaking, you know, most of the people I've met through horror fandom are, are really great people. And I, there's, I can probably count on one hand the number of times that I've ever been met with like real hostility or felt unsafe. Um, but, you know, my experience is very subjective, so I'm not speaking for other people when I say this. But I, th- I think things are getting better, and I don't know if you've been following some of the discussions that have been happening with um, Cinestate and Joe Bob Briggs. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but people are, are becoming more vocal and are, and are uh, trying to push discussions forward uh, to make horror spaces more inclusive and um, to, to, to make these spaces places where... Uh, silencing and and uh, sweeping bad behavior under the rug uh, won't be tolerated anymore. So mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, I've actually um, been following some of that recently. I um, started watching the new drive-in. I wasn't really aware of all the controversy surrounding him with some of the remarks that he's made in the past or more recently. And now I've been kind of turned off from watching that, just knowing some of his opinions that are not exactly very inclusive. It just, it just gives me like this gross feeling, yeah. you know, surrounding like the whole, and like everyone loves him and everyone's watching him and everyone, you know, like Friday nights, everyone's like l- posting like live videos of them watching it. And especially now with everyone being stuck in the house and being quarantined, I think it's a way for people to kind of like get together and, and feel like they're a part of this community. And like, maybe it's almost, um, it's replacing the, the feeling of going to the theater. But I just, after reading some, like some of the things you've been talking about, I can't enjoy it anymore. And I, I do think people need to stand up and stand up in the horror community and, I've been very pleased this week seeing on Instagram and just how many people have been posting like horror, the horror community stands with black lives matter, uh, the horror community against racism. And, um, but you know, people like Joe Bob Briggs, we need to hold him accountable too. just because he's a big star. Doesn't mean that he can get away with saying some of the things that he's been saying. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, another part of it too, is that, a, a lot of these people who have been watching The Last Drive-In are people who grew up loving Joe Bob Briggs. And, you know, that was a time when, as a culture, we were a lot more permissive of, of, of certain things that just wouldn't fly now. So these people are watching it through uh, the lens of nostalgia, and they, they are not viewing it critically. And, and mm-hmm. they weren't ever, um, you know, conditioned to, to view that kind of media critically. It was just like a a feel good thing. And that's what it is for them now. But it's very disheartening to see these same people speak out and say, you know, um, you know, we support LGBT horror fans. And yet um, they'll watch Joe Bob make a transphobic joke. It's like it doesn't register with them that there's a problem with that. But, you know, conversations are happening and people seem to be more receptive to criticism and and to um reassessing their perspective and how they see things uh so that's encouraging i agree and it i i like your point about the nostalgia too it's like you know take for instance rosemary's baby it's an amazing horror movie but it was made by a pedophile yeah <laughs> like you know does that mean we all need to like throw away our copy of rosemary's baby or never watch it again it's just these are like the conversations that we're having now and it's it's about time, frankly, Absolutely. but it's 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 a big gray area. Everything's not black and white, you know. Rosemary's Baby throws me for a loop because I feel like that movie is 
one of the best movies about gaslighting. Like, <laughs> like it feels weirdly feminist in a way in that respect. And then it's like, but then you remember, oh, uh, Roman Polanski is uh, pretty garbage. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. So you've kind of touched on this a little bit, Adriana, but um, I kind of sort of along the same lines of what we've been talking about. Sharon and I are lifelong horror fans. And like, you know, when we were little, being girls who like scary movies got us kind of weird looks. But that's, yep. I'm, I'm guessing probably because of the third and fourth graders weren't watching Freddy Krueger on the regular. But um, I know that even as adults, Men especially sometimes are taken aback by a woman who not only likes horror but can speak intelligently about it. And like I know that the name of our podcast is, is you know, tongue in cheek and we laugh a lot on here, but we kind of know what we're talking about. You know, clearly you do, too. I'm curious what challenges, if any, have you faced in your career that might have played out differently if you were a dude? Oh, man. Uh, I have to just like think back across an entire lifetime of experiences so far. <laughs> take your time. Take your time. I have to I have to be very honest and say that um, so far in my in my career um, as a programmer and as a, uh, a horror fan working within horror spaces, I haven't experienced a lot of overt sexism, but certainly I've encountered, you know, plenty of men who have um condescended to me and talked down to me about horror or who made assumptions that I, I wouldn't know about, you know, a particular film or a particular director and that sort of thing, which, um, you know, is relatively benign compared to what some women have had to endure. But it, it you know, it's still a problem because a culture that is permissive of those of those smaller issues eventually allows for those issues to snowball into um, the, the, the bigger offenses and, and uh, you know, so I feel like it's uh, important to address these issues like at every level, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Most of the real nasty stuff I've experienced as a horror fan was when I was younger. I went, uh, I endured 12 years of Catholic schooling. Mm. And <laughs> um, especially when I was younger, um, my interest in horror movies caused uh, a lot of problems for me with teachers um, and with uh, the nun who was the principal of, of my grade school. And I don't know how much time we have, if I can go into this at all. It's kind of a long story, but basically... Oh, yeah. P please go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so We have no time constraints here. So yeah, go, go for it. Awesome. So my love of horror was really fostered by my stepfather, who was a huge genre film fan, super into horror, super into sci-fi. And, you know, from a very young age, he would let me stay up late and watch, you know, horror movies with him. That's good parenting. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, but in second grade, uh, we were required to keep journals. Every, every student had to keep a journal and we had to write about uh, our day or whatever interested us at that point in time. So, of course, I filled it with stuff about horror movies with illustrations. <laughs> at the time, I was really into full moon like all of the stuff they were putting out. So I loved Puppet Master. I loved their The Pit and the Pendulum. Like anything they Ooh. did with Jeffrey Combs, basically. And I remember vividly, I drew a little picture of like a guy on a slab with the, uh, the blade swinging over him. <laughs> and uh, as you can imagine, that didn't go over well. So my mother was called into the office, uh, uh, the administrator's office at school to discuss this with my teacher and the principal. And they essentially accused her of being a negligent negligent parent um, oh my because God. she allowed me to watch horror movies, which, by the way, again, it was my stepfather who really watched these movies with me. Uh, my mom had nothing to do with it, but of course, she was expected to to bear the responsibility of, of doing this. Um, and I just want to make it clear that my stepfather and, and my mom, when she would watch with us, she's not really a horror fan. Uh, you know, he was always on hand to explain things to me, to answer questions that I had. Um, and, you know, obviously, if, if it seemed like I was overwhelmed, he'd turn it off. It was a very responsible way of sharing media with your child. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I still have a lot of resentment about this incident because, you know, I love my parents. And it was the stigma associated with horror fans and enjoying horror is very bizarre. I, you know, I've seen a lot of men say there's something wrong mentally with women who enjoy horror. 
it, it's very strange. But uh, yeah, I, I, I can honestly say that there are a few things in life that have been more of a refuge to me than horror movies. Uh, and so I'm very passionate about them and I will defend them. I agree. And I, I think that's really funny that men would say there's something wrong with women who would watch horror movies when most of the time it's men making the movies where you have like helpless naked women yes. being raped and attacked. There's That's okay. But if you watch that and you're a woman, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. It's strange. Interesting. Oh my gosh. Your poor mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's 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 a great story. Thank you for sharing because that was oh my gosh. I would love. My mom to wasn't see... having any of it either. Like she she still detests that teacher to this day. Good for her. Good for her. I'd love to see that picture. By the way, that you drew. <laughs> that's so funny. I wish I had it. Like it it must be in a box at in my parents' house somewhere because my mom has not thrown a single thing away that I've ever made at school or anything. But I I I'd love to look through that too because I'm sure it's amazing. That is so funny. So how did that all pan out then with with um, your mom being called to the school and everything? How did she respond? Which I'm assuming they probably thought you were into some sort of like witchcraft or Satanism. I have no clue. I honestly, <laughs> I don't think I've, I don't think she's ever fully told me what she said or did, but it must have been effective because I never had problems from those teachers ever again. Awesome. Well done, mom. <laughs> I had other problems with other teachers that were un- unrelated to horror, but. <laughs> ha- haven't we all? <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to actually want we really wanted to ask you. I noticed that you did a review about the David Lynch documentary, The Art Life. Um, and Sharon you guys our- really did your research. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, that's how we roll <laughs> you looked really interesting and so google and then fall down a rabbit hole there you go are you do you consider yourself a lynch fan oh yeah he's one of my favorite filmmakers okay i was mm-hmm. gonna say we won't be offended if you say no but i figured if you wrote about him you must like him so <laughs> yeah and uh you know sometimes it's hard to defend my love of David Lynch films just because people are so I I feel like people have this very specific view of what narrative filmmaking should be or what it's supposed to look like. And with David Lynch, he is much more interested in creating a particular kind of mood or feeling within the viewer than he is interested in telling a straightforward story. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think that's just as um valid uh, and but it's a lot more uh, it's less accessible uh, and so I think people have a hard time with David Lynch because they feel like they have to parse it or they have to they have to know exactly what his intent was or what he's trying to do and and I always just try to tell people like no d- just try to to focus on how it's making you feel mm-hmm. uh, because I, I feel like Lynch is one of the best filmmakers working right now when it comes to uh, in e- evoking a feeling um, w- with his audience. I mean, uh, the way he utilizes room tone uh, and, and sound design is, is, is extremely effective. And I'm just a fan of like the, you know, the dark side of suburbia, expose it sort of thing that he has going on in a lot of his work with, you know, Blue Velvet or Twin Peaks. Absolutely. Yeah, Blue Velvet is my favorite movie of all time. David Lynch is my favorite artist. I don't even want to just call him a director because he's he's a true artist. He does yeah. everything. Um, he's my favorite artist of all time. And um, Twin Peaks is my favorite television show of all time. I have a huge um, Twin Peaks uh, leg tattoo. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, I honestly, I could talk about David Lynch for hours and hours and hours. Um, the art life was amazing I just love really watching him work and I love his process and you don't get a lot you get like little glimpses into his mind but I think if you knew everything about him he would become boring like his work wouldn't be as fascinating he wouldn't be as fascinating I like the mystery yeah, that is there. And I like that he keeps the mystery. And I also like that, you know, I know a lot of people 
like you were saying that they don't really get his work or understand his work and you have to defend why you like it. A lot of people think he's pretentious, which right. I completely disagree with because I think people who are pretentious will tell you, this is what my work is. And if you can't see that, then you're dumb. He will never ever say anything like that. He likes it when the viewer forms their own opinions on it. And he allows that. Yeah. So, which to me makes him not pretentious. And I mean, there's that there's that famous meme where he it's that image of him being interviewed and the text says, Eraserhead is about the Bible or something like that. And uh, the interviewer says, can you elaborate on that? <laughs> no. I love that. Yeah. It's Eraserhead is my most spiritual film ever. That's it. Can you elaborate on that? No. <laughs> But yeah, I I really loathe the word pretentious. I feel it's super overused, especially in casual film criticism. Like it, people love to trivialize and denigrate things that they don't immediately relate to or understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wish people would stop it. I do have a question for you, Mindy, and I have talked about this before. As far as David Lynch's work, um, his portrayal of women in movies, I personally don't have a problem with the way he portrays women. I know a lot of people think that some of his films are sexist in the way he portrays them because they're often the victim. Uh, They're being abused. They're murdered. Um, I mean, you know, you've, you've seen his films. Like what, what are your feelings on that? Well, I guess I'll start just by saying that I, I do not believe that depiction equals endorsement. And I think Um, very often when we see violence against women in in David Lynch's films, um, it is unquestionably presented as something evil. Having said that, I do think there are certain criticisms that have some merit and are worth kind of exploring. Um, Like the fact that, you know, a lot of his work kind of presents that Madonna whore dichotomy where women are either, either entirely saintly or like, you know, evil and they use their sexuality in um, unsavory ways or, or, you know, however you want to put it. But generally speaking, I I don't think David Lynch makes sexist films, but I I think it's healthy to have discussions about these things uh, because I I think it's important to contextualize what we watch and to be able to, um, you know, watch things critically and be critical of, of things we love as well as uh, things that we don't. What was your quote? Did you say, I don't think depiction equals endorsement? Because I love that. (laughs) I want a t-shirt with that on it. (laughs) That's a great, no, that's a really great point. It's it's all about how how the, it's all about yeah. context. Yeah, basically. and that actually right at this top when you said like, oh, I love the the dark side of suburbia. I was like thinking I almost like texted Sharon while you were talking to be like, let's hang out with her more <laughs> 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 because that's kind of like what I, what drew me to David Lynch as well. And I, I I think I can speak for Sharon when I say that we probably couldn't agree more. Um, we're total dorks. We even went to Twin Peaks Fest in North Bend, Washington. That's awesome. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. They canceled it. It's no, no more. Yeah. But we've met like a few of the actors and we're like uber dorks about it, but we don't care. We we take that title and hold it proudly, right, Sharon? Absolutely. Yeah. I we, think I think that's great. And I went, mean, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going to say we went to his festival of disruption um together as well and it was just like this beautiful like love fest like a two-day love fest of just like art and creation and like I just think David Lynch is magical I just love everything he does I fully agree did you watch the return Twin Peaks the return I did (laughs) thoughts every week (laughs) I know right (laughs) Well, the process was to rewatch the episode from last week before you watched the new episode. That was like what we always did because it was there was just so much to process after you watch it. Right. You need like a week to think about it, read all like the chat room conversations, you know, go through Reddit, go through all the theories <laughs> and then rewatch it and then watch the new episode and start it all over again for the next, what, 18 weeks. That was pretty much my process as well. I was I was super active on the Twin Peaks subreddit, <laughs> posting theories and, oh, and everything really? like that. So, <laughs> I love yeah. it. I love it. 
You know, I haven't had the pleasure of going to any Twin Peaks conventions, but I, I live right outside of Philadelphia, and David Lynch, as you probably well know, lived in Philadelphia for a number of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there's a a place in his old neighborhood called the Philadelphia Mausoleum of Art, and every year they have this big celebration of David Lynch called um, Eraserhood Forever, because they call that neighborhood the Eraserhood. Aww. It's, it's pretty awesome. So they do, like, a, an art show... And then they have performances, trivia, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. And the last several years, it's gotten bigger and bigger. And they've, they started to get people who are involved with Twin Peaks or other Lynch productions. So, like, uh, a few years ago, they had Shoo Shoo there to perform, like, their, their Twin Peaks album. Oh. Uh, and then the, the year after that, it was Krista Bell. Oh, man. And then they had uh, Cheryl and Fenn. So, yeah, I've been... Oh, and they had the lady in the radiator one year. I got to meet her. Oh, <laughs> that's so awesome. And she signed she signed a special lady in the radiator poster that they designed for the event. So, you know, I feel pretty lucky that uh, something like that is so close by that I can attend every year. That's amazing. And, um, How have we never yeah. heard of that, Mindy? We're going to have to do like a road trip, I think. And <laughs> It's right. worth it. Do you know what, what time of year is that usually? It's in October. It's usually like the first weekend in October. Oh, perfect. Ooh. My favorite month, too. That's like Halloween month. Very, very cool. Oh, well, thank you for that tip because <laughs> we'll pro- we may even see you there. <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. We honestly have not done an entire Twin Peaks episode, which we've talked about. So we've been talking about coming up with different topics or having a, a guest who's a fan of the show come up with a topic and then discussing it. So we might have you back on our show if you're willing to just discuss a Twin Peaks topic with us. I would love that. Because I I feel like if we go off right now, we can probably spend like two to three hours talking about Twin Peaks The Return. (laughs) But we have some more questions we want to ask you before that. (laughs) I'm just still amazed that we got to see Diane. Oh my God, right? I know. (laughs) Well, and like we, it was just so funny because there was some sort of whisper, I think, around where people were like, Diane's really going to be Laura Dern. And I was like, nah, just because (laughs) I was like, that would be too amazing. Like, there's no way that's going to happen. That's too amazing. And then the second she turned around, I think I did scream, like in my living room by myself, like in jerk. Like, I was like, oh my God. Oh, love it. Thank you, David Lynch, for that. Okay, so like Sherry said, we do have a few other questions for you, but let's let's put a pin in Twin Peaks because I think we should we should if you're willing, we'd love to have you back and talk in depth a little bit more on the topic. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, in terms of our podcast, we've been talking about wanting to do an episode that focuses on feminist horror films. Um, as anyone who listens to us probably knows by now, one of my very favorites is the original Black Christmas from the 70s. Yes. What does feminist horror mean to you? And do you have a favorite feminist horror film? What is it and why? Um, well, until recently, I really loved The Love Witch. Oh, yeah. Which, oh, I've I mean, I have complicated feelings about it uh, because... I don't know if, if you're aware uh, that the filmmaker Anna Biller, Biller is a TERF. Yeah, this, aspects of the, the film's politics seem kind of gender essentialist. But, mm. um, you know, I, I really loved that movie, despite that, um, for a long time. That one's been on my list, but I have not watched that one yet. I would still recommend watching it. It's really an incredible achievement. I mean, she wrote, directed, edited... Um, did the costuming, the music, uh, set design. It was really like a one-person operation. Wow. And it's a more recent film, right? But it's made to look kind of like it yes. was filmed back in like the 70s or... Correct. Okay. Yeah, it has like... Um, the color palette is very 70s. And some of like the 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 camera tricks are, are very much sort of, of of a piece with, you know, what was common in 70s genre films. Let me think. What else? I love Jennifer's Body. I still not see that. I, I still haven't seen it. I, I Sorry. Words failed me for a second there. But <laughs> I, I that's a good one because it's been on my list too. But I just haven't made it. My mom's seen it. And I haven't even <laughs> seen it yet. I don't know if it's streaming, streaming anywhere right now. But okay. Um, I'll have to look that up then. I'm also... This isn't quite horror. This is kind of more like pure exploitation. 
Um, okay. But, uh, you know, the, the the rape revenge genre is very controversial for good reason, um, especially because many of those films are directed by men and do not have input from women at all. Um, mm-hmm. But there's one film I, uh, called Miss 45, directed by Abel Ferrara, and uh, it was writ- co-written by and starring Zoe Lund. Oh. And I love this movie because... Um, it kind of diverts from the typical three-act structure that you would see in a, in a rape revenge film and really puts the focus on this the trauma of this woman and, and what how she is reeling and, and what she is experiencing um, in the aftermath of a very traumatic um, event. Beyond that, it's just cool to see her dressed as a nun and shooting assholes. Um, <laughs> it's very cathartic. That's kind of Sharon's jam is those kind of movies. Yeah. Is this on MMS? It's I, I think it's just pronounced Miss 45. No, is it is it on your um the Midnight Movie Society? Is it Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um I don't know if it's streaming anywhere. I know that Draft House Films released a Blu-ray recently. Mm. Um it's worth a blind buy. Cool. Okay, yeah. Spencer just looked it up on IMDb right now. It's from 1981. I've never heard of this movie. Interesting. Yeah, and it's like, I'm a big fan of films that are set in, like, the old decrepit New York City in the 70s and 80s. Because mm-hmm. um, they're just perfect time capsules of a city that no longer exists. Right. Like, that it is just so far removed from what New York City is now. Um, so it's kind of a, it sits at a cross section of, a, like, a bunch of things that interest me. But yeah, I mean, as far as like what feminist horror is to me, I don't know. I think it it can be a lot of different things, but it's always important for me that um, the female characters have agency Mm. and that they're three dimensional. Yeah, agreed. Those are the two most important things to me. Um, I don't other than that, I don't really think there's any any kind of like secret formula or, or specific set of bullet points that a movie has to hit to be feminist. It's just kind of like you know it when you you can feel it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we uh, slowly but surely we're starting to see more and more women behind the camera in horror. I feel like yeah, um, we listed a few like just off the top of our heads. Like I personally am a fan of Jennifer Kent. Um, talk about like oh rape- man, have you seen the Nightingale? Dude, talk about rape revenge movies. Yeah, that. that movie is incredible, and I do not want to rewatch it anytime soon. <laughs> exactly. We reviewed it. We did like a, a yearly review of horror movies for um, 2019, and I, I was charged to watch that movie because I loved The Babadook, and I, I really loved Jennifer Kent. And Sharon was like, well, how was it? And I was like, it was good. <laughs> like, I didn't know how to react. But yeah, it was like the best movie I never want to see again. Like, it, yeah. but it was amazing. And it doesn't, I mean, the things that movie addresses, it, I, I feel like it's really important because it's oh still, you know, it's issues that we're still grappling with right now. Um, you know, yeah. the the impact of colonialism and the subjugation of women and uh, indigenous people. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think she does a really good job of, of illustrating how violent that system is um, and not just you know, literal violence, but there's plenty of that in the film, but kind of like the emotional and psychological violence. Well, and I thought it was kind of masterful too, how like it was incredibly violent to watch, but at the same time, it wasn't gratuitous violence, like any of the rape scenes or anything like that. Like I was, it was so hard to watch, but it wasn't, it could, it could have been so much more graphic. And she, I love that she finds just the right way kind of like David Lynch, to get the emotions across without having to show you physically. Exactly. And it doesn't try to, like, sexualize the violence either or make it titillating. Like, that's another issue with a lot of rape revenge films. There are are scenes of of sexual assault, uh, and it should be horrifying, but they're framed in such a way that it's meant to titillate. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and so that's obviously uh, messed up. Absolutely. Um, well, Jennifer Kent, she's one that we're seeing. She's a big, I'm a big fan of hers. And of course, we had, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention Jennifer Lynch. Um, I know yes. Sharon's seen a bunch of her movies too, um, probably more so than me. Um, but who are some of your favorite female directors working in horror? And is there anyone we should be watching that's coming up or keeping on our radar or anything like that? I mean, I love Karen Kusama. Um, Jennifer's Body and the Invitation. 
Okay. Um, oh, the invitation. Ooh, okay, I love yeah, the invitation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the invitation is great. I like uh, Amy Holden Jones, who did the Slumber Party Massacre, um, which is, uh, that's really unique because, I mean, you don't really see a lot of, um, like, female directed or feminist slasher movies. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, that really stands out in the horror canon for me. Let me think here. Um, have you seen uh, that movie Revenge? That's not really horror, but it's, it's more like thriller. Mm. But uh, I haven't, but I know I've seen it's come up in my you should watch this like streaming <laughs> suggestions stuff. Yeah, it uh, kind of flips the script on a lot of tropes. OK, good to know. Uh, you see in like horror and revenge films. Um, Veronica Franz, who's the co-creator of Goodnight Mommy in the Lodge, were oh, yeah. fans of those movies. Yeah, we just watched The Lodge. Um, I never know how to say her name right, but I love uh, Anna Lily Amapur. I don't say that. I did not say that right, but A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. I really like that one. I was less enthusiastic about The Bad Bunch or The Bad Batch. Excuse me. I don't think I saw The Bad Batch. That one's on Netflix. Okay. But um, uh, a lot of my favorite female filmmakers are actually do not work within horror or, or have done limited work within horror. Um, like I love Doris Wishman, who was a pioneer of exploitation and sexploitation films. Uh, and she dabbled in horror as well. Um, she made a film called a night to dismember. Mm. Um, and it's super low budget and schlocky, but I love that sort of thing. And, uh, it's actually available on YouTube right now. I don't think it is available legally anywhere. Um, but it is on YouTube. I love Roberta Finley. She was another exploitation filmmaker. She made a film. It, it's kind of horror, kind of slasher, kind of um, melodrama called A Woman's Torment. And that was released recently on Blu-ray by Vinegar Syndrome. There's actually, there's two cuts. One is kind of like a, a hardcore cut. And then one is the standard R cut. And, and the R cut is actually a lot better. It kind of focuses more on the story, but it kind of follows this woman as she loses her grip on her sanity. But um, the way the way that it is explored in the movie is like really refreshingly progressive and feminist for the time period. We're gonna have to make a list because this is a lot of good suggestion suggestions and a lot of things that I know I haven't seen and I don't think Mindy has either. But we'll have to no. make a list and put it in our episode description when this um, podcast, when this sure. episode is released so that For other sure. people can, it's so hard when you're listening to a podcast and you're like doing stuff and you like, you can't like just stop and like, Oh shit, I got to write all this down. So we'll help you out and we'll make the list for you, everyone. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. Um, veering away from horror really quick. You mentioned in your email to us that you're a musician. Um, what instruments do you play? And are you in a band? Do you ever perform? I tell people right now that I'm between bands. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any projects currently, but I'm I'm working on getting a few things started. But uh, my I uh, my main instrument is guitar, but I can play you know bass guitar, drums, keys, uh, mandolin. Wow! I was in uh, marching band and wind ensemble and. Uh, percussion ensemble in yes. high school oh so was mindy um, so i played a lot of keyboard <laughs> percussions like marimba and um hell yeah i was vibraphone a, i was the lead uh snare drummer in marching band and then totally played i loved playing the vibes in high school that was like one it's of, so fun uh yay what up percussionist <laughs> sorry <laughs> um what kind of music do you play now or do you have a favorite genre that you listen to I mean, my tastes are pretty eclectic. Uh, as far as, like, the, the type of music I've played in the past, I am. I mean, I've been in, like, a jazz funk fusion band. I've been in kind of, like, a, a psychedelic garage rock type band. The, the stuff I'm, I'm working on now or, like, hoping to work on I have uh, is more synth-based um, and maybe kind of, like, harsh noise, industrial. That was the stuff that I was really into in high school, like, metal um, industrial, like anything atonal, but no, I, I like all kinds of stuff. I love hip hop. I love pop music. I really love pop music. I think, you know, you can get across some subversive ideas in pop songs if people don't question it. Cause they're, you know, it's got a nice beat or whatever. So, um, Cause it's so catchy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't really, I don't really limit myself uh, as far as 
the kind of music I listen to. Awesome. Well, we um, have a certain thing that we do with with anybody we interview on the show. We like to do a little set of lightning round questions. Um, don't think too hard. They're just okay. quick questions, <laughs> just for fun. Uh, so we're going to start off with an easy one. What's the very first scary movie you remember seeing? Hellraiser. Nice. Nice. What's your all-time favorite scary movie, if you had to pick? The Innocents. Yes, good answer. Sorry. Uh, Freddie, Jason, or Michael Myers? Freddie. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm cheering along here. Uh, I happened, thanks to the internet, I happened to see a picture of you with Adrian Barbeau. Uh, um, I, I'm desperately trying to control my jealousy, be, jealousy and impulse to ask you about every single detail of that encounter. But instead, I'll ask you, who is the horror movie icon whom you are most excited to meet or have met and why does it need to be someone in front of the camera or can it be a filmmaker no anybody okay david cronenberg (gasps) oh amazing tell us about that well that's who i want to meet i mean he's one of my favorite filmmakers and he does public appearances so rarely yeah that that's somebody i i've had i've been fortunate enough to have met most of you know the artists i consider my heroes but he's someone who has evaded me so um <laughs> i really really love to meet him sometime and who was your favorite person that you did meet clive barker oh Whoa. oh <laughs> that was very recent so he he's one of my horror heroes um as i mentioned like hellraiser was the first horror, scary movie i remember seeing and i became like full-blown obsessed with that entire franchise i think at the time like, the first four movies were released. So, like, I rented them all from Blockbuster, or, or what, rather, my, my mom rented them. Yeah, like, I from there, I, as I got older, I kind of got into his prose fiction, which, I, for me, actually eclipses his, his films. Um, I think he is, this is maybe a controversial opinion, but <laughs> I think he's a much better writer than he is a filmmaker. <laughs> and uh, he was, like, the first gay, per- like, out gay person I remember learning about, so... Yeah, he, he's just been very important to me through, like, every stage of my life. And, like, different works of his have have, have meant different things to me over the years. And um, I got to meet him last year at a Monster Mania in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Was he as nice as you hoped? Like, because I know sometimes you meet someone that you've always wanted to meet. I have a friend who met, like, one of her idols and they were a jerk. Like, we've not had that experience so far, but was he awesome? He was so sweet, and he was, like, talking to everybody, and everybody was, like, love and dear, and uh, it was great. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's so good. I actually have a collection of his, um, the, like, the Cenobites that he put out, like, the... Um, are, are, is that, like, the Tortured Angels? It could be the Tortured Angels. Oh, but Tortured Souls. That's tor- yes, Tortured of. Souls. I was, like, something about angels wasn't clicking. Um, yes, it was, like, the different Tortured Souls dolls. Or da- not dolls. <laughs> Figurines. Figurines, yes. Collect- collector's items. But I was big into those. And w- when I was working at a, um, a restaurant, which is famous for chicken wings and boobs, we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in the break room and one of my friends came in with a birthday gift for me. And it was one of the tortured souls. And it was the one that was like hanging by a bunch of different hooks from its face and had like this um, clear belly with like a almost like a dead fetus or something in it and there was like blood bags and all this stuff on it so like (laughs) all the girls in the room they're like oh my god what did you get what did you get and I opened it up and literally like every one of my coworkers just like went silent and like took a step back and everyone just looked at me like what the fuck is wrong with you? And I was just like, oh my God, this is awesome. I love it. Thanks. So that's great. Yeah. I love Clyde Barker. Yeah. I never collected any of that, but uh, funnily enough, those toys were produced by uh, McFarlane toys and I was super into spawn as a kid. So I collected like all of the spawn toys that they made, but I never got into the, the Clyde Barker side of things. Okay. Yeah. They're actually really, really cool. 
like the detail that went into them or it was uh yeah like i've seen i've seen close-up images of them but i've never actually held them or seen them in person yeah mine are all like still in the boxes like in my storage unit like an hour away from my house we have we live in such a small place that i have no room for it over here so one day when we get a bigger place they will be on display in my office but that's awesome that you got to meet clive barker Yeah, I'm still kind of reeling from that. (laughs) That's awesome. Sharon, would you like to take our final uh, lightning round question? Yes. This is um, usually we ask this of almost every one of our guests, depending on who they are. Sometimes, you know, I have to feel them out. I'm like, "Mm, this question may not be appropriate. This is also a question I used to ask when I worked at that chicken boob restaurant because... (laughs) I, I just wanted to see the reactions on guys' faces when I would ask this. Who's your favorite serial killer? Oh, my God. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a loaded question because any answer is almost like you're endorsing their actions. Well, by favorite, I kind of mean most fascinating. Like, who fascinates right, you the most? Right, yeah. Like, obviously, is you, you're not like, yay, Bundy. Like, of way course. to go that you killed all these women. Like, no. Like, who who fascinates you the most? Um, I guess I, I'm a big true crime fan, so, um, Us too. I've, I've read a lot, uh, but I, I think the person who pops into my, my mind immediately is Dennis Nielsen. Mm, okay. And wh- why is that? Um, I don't know. I just, a lot, I, so I'm sure you've noticed that, um, there's kind of like this trend in true crime where like marginalized communities are often targeted um, because they are due to various reasons, like they, the law enforcement agencies aren't going to care about them as much, um, to put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I'm also kind of interested in all of the ways that like being closeted affects people, uh, like psychologically and emotionally. And, uh, Dennis Nielsen was like a gay man who targeted other gay men and, um, I don't know. It, it's just interesting to unpack that sort of thing. And I don't I don't know if you're familiar with his case, but he would like take them home and then he would kill them and leave their bodies propped up in his house like to keep him company. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he would like dispose of them. Uh, I can't remember if he would like shove them down his bathtub drain or something, something like that. Uh, and eventually he was caught because there was just, like this overwhelming sewage smell, um, and a, a plumber eventually discovered like human remains mm-hmm. in the in the plumbing and the building. Um, and there was a, a horror movie based on him too, yeah, right. Which was called was it? Dan- what was it called? No, not that one, no. Spencer. There was a. It was like Daniel or something, but it was like huh. loosely based on him. But it was like a British horror movie. I just watched it like within the past couple of years. I uh, I actually am not familiar with that, but I know that um, I can't think of uh, David Tennant is going to be playing him in an upcoming. I don't know if it's a series for the BBC. Yes, I had heard of that. Yeah, it. I don't think it's out yet, though. Right? No. Like yeah. 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 Cool. Good answer. I mean, not good answer, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Interesting answer. You know, it's not. It's not one of like the the usual responses. Yeah, but interesting nonetheless. He's a little more obscure, but yeah, there's there's like reasoning behind, you know. You've you've thought about this, don't lie. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> well, before we we go, um how can folks subscribe to the Midnight Movie Society? Um so they can go to midnightmoviesociety.com and they can sign up for a free trial or they can go straight to subscription if they want. We also have a number of our films available um, to non-subscribers just to, to rent or download. Oh, cool. So uh, we also have a Roku app. So if you have a Roku, you can search Midnight Movie Society uh, and you can find us there. Uh, find us in the Apple Store, App Store, because um, we have a, uh, an iOS app as well. Oh, cool. Um, Are there any films coming to the streaming service soon that you're especially excited about? Um, We have some exclusives lined up, but they have not been officially announced yet, so I cannot talk about them. 
Okay. <laughs> but yes, there's some cool stuff coming. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, if any of our listeners have any questions about the service, where can they find you on the social medias? Uh, well, they can email me directly at adriana at midnightmoviesociety.com. And that's A-D-R-I-A-N-N-A. I'm also on Twitter uh, at E-A-D-X-B-B, um, which sounds weird. It's a guitar tuning. <laughs> it's the guitar tuning that Ricky Wilson of the B-52s used on 52 Girls. Wow, that is really in-depth and thoughtful. And now I'm not going to forget it. That's awesome. <laughs> Where else am I online? That's kind of really it. I mean, I have a personal Facebook page, but that's just kind of like personal. Sure. But but yeah, you can you can reach me um, by emailing me through my Midnight Movie Society account, or you can find me on Twitter. And is it cool if we share links to those in our episode description? Yes, that's totally fine. Awesome. And I just looked up the name of that movie that I was talking about. It's called Tony from 2009. I don't know that one. I'm going to have to look it up. Yeah, it doesn't say it's specifically about him, but it might be loosely based on him. But there is another one called Cold Light of Day from 1989 that um, is a fictionalized account based on the actions of Dennis Nilsson. So that one's more specifically about Ooh. him. But yeah, Tony's definitely, it's about a guy who kills men that he meets at gay bars that he brings back back to his flat. And basically the same thing his uh he's blaming like the smell of his apartment and clogged drains and everything and I, yeah that that definitely sounds like it was inspired by absolutely uh, the nielsen case well i've got some homework to do <laughs> um b- besides this podcast what other podcasts of any do you appear on and where can we listen to those um good question so i've been on i've two pod or three podcasts now so far um one is called the shame list picture show and if you Google that, um, their social media pages should come up. Uh, and then I was at, I recently I was a guest on the Ellis Cinema podcast and Horror Brew. Awesome. Well, I'm, we're going to list those, right, in, our, in yeah. our notes, our episode notes. But thank you for sharing all of that. Absolutely. And is, are there any, like, final thoughts, final words that you want to say before we, before we sign off? I guess just you know, thanks again for inviting me on the show to talk with you all. And uh, I really like that there is a feminist horror podcast like this Aww. out there. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was our absolute pleasure to speak with you. And I would, yeah, I think we would definitely love to have you on the show again to do a uh, David Lynch episode or Twin Peaks episode or I'd love that. Yeah. Or just like in general. <laughs> so you might be getting another email from us at some point. And be like, let's talk cool. about this. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We re- It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had a really nice time. All right. Well, thank you all for listening to that interview. Like we said, we will include all of Adriana's contact info the names of the other podcasts that she was in, if you want to hear more from her, along with the movie and book recommendations that we discussed in this episode. If you have any questions for her that you would like us to pass along, you can email us at whorestalkwhore at gmail.com. You can also email us there if you want to share any ghost stories, creepy stories. You can tell us about the time you met one of your idols like Clive Barker or David Cronenberg. We hope that you are all still staying safe out there and being kind to each other. And as always, thanks Thanks for for getting getting creepy with us. Sharon, you want a beer? Uh, Oh my God.